Good afternoon. Is working. Um, thank you for coming to today's event. Unfortunately, what usually happens in, in DC when the forecast talks about snow and rain, this type of thing, between such a fascinating uh, event here, people stay at home watching TV, perhaps. In any event, we're going to start our program this afternoon with uh, some welcoming remarks from our president and CEO, Dr. Kenneth Weinstein. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Jaime. Good afternoon. And welcome to the uh, Walter and Betsy Stern Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. We are delighted to be hosting today's event with the, uh, in conjunction with the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis and our old friend, uh, Professor uh, Robert Faltzgraf of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Old friend, and not in terms of age, but in terms of longtime collaborator, let me note. Uh, Latin America and Washington doesn't seem to be much of a priority these days for the administration, except when Benjamin Netanyahu decides to show up in town. And, uh, so, but uh, in all, and I'm referring obviously to Vice President Biden's suddenly announced trip to Central America and his recent op-ed on the subject, which uh, is very welcome. We, have, we at Hudson have been paying close attention to Latin America um, for several decades, and in particular since uh, since 2013, or t since 2009, I should add. We're obviously in a critical moment uh, in Latin America, and in particular for Mexico. There were huge hopes following the 2012 election that uh, Enrique Peña Nieto could begin to overhaul Mexico's sclerotic political and economic institutions, begin to privatize Pemex, kickstart economic growth and battle the corruption that has been endemic to that country for decades. Now, despite the huge hope uh, in that country, despite the initial popularity and some initial successes, the direction has not been positive, and the president has faced many challenges uh, on the security side. We all know the murder of uh, the students on the economic side and on the corruption side progress does not seem to be, have been made. Can President Nieto turn things around, or is it already too late? That's the question before our very distinguished panel today that uh, we are hosting in conjunction with the Institute uh, for Foreign Policy Analysis as part of our series funded by the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, to which we're grateful. I am uh, delighted to turn the panel over to uh, our good friend, uh, Professor uh, Robert Falsgraf, who really needs no introduction. He's one of America's most distinguished uh, academics writing on foreign and defense policy uh, issues, and we're delighted to have him as a partner. Just some more remarks uh, concerning our program today. Uh, as you know, Mexico is in a precarious situation, and President Enrique Peña Nieto's reformist agenda is in serious trouble. Security is a major concern, as evidenced by 43 students who were murdered last fall and corruption remains a serious problem. Indeed, the president himself has been ensnared in a corruption scandal over the past several months. We are gathered here today to discuss whether President Peña Nieto can turn things around or is it already too late. To discuss uh, these issues, we have convened a very esteemed and prestigious panel which I am honored to introduce. The moderator of today's discussion will be Robert Falsgraf, a president of the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis and a professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He has authored 
numerous books and holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Then we will have Luis Rubio, Chairman of the Center for Research and Development, SIDAC, an independent research institution, an expert on Mexican affairs. Mr. Rubio is a global <coughs> fellow at the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. We also hear from two excellent uh, participants. Uh, Hector Chamis teaches at Georgetown University Center for Latin American Studies and Democracy and Governance Program. And he's my favorite columnist in El País from Spain, uh, which I buy only <laughs> to read, to read uh, Luis, uh, Luis's column. And Miguel Basañez is a professor of culture and development and director of the Judiciary Reform Program at Tufts. We're honored to have them. Thank you again for coming, and please enjoy. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think I'll just remain right here so that we can get yes, started yes, of as, course. as quickly yeah, yeah. as possible. That's the idea. Uh, and uh, say that, uh, first of all, it has always been a pleasure for me personally and professionally to uh, work with Ambassador Darren Blum uh, in this uh, important series. Uh, as you know, we have focused over the years on uh, radical populism in Latin America, but we have uh, broadened our focus wherever necessary and possible to bring into focus uh, the um, relevant uh, issues of economics and uh, geopolitics and so forth. So we chose uh, for our first, uh, uh, our first uh, program for 2015 uh, this focus on Mexico. And uh, you already have heard, both in the, uh, in the program that was uh, distributed and in the other introductory remarks, uh, the uh, basic issues that we all are trying to grapple with as we uh, think about uh, Mexico and uh, its evolution and indeed <coughs> our geostrategically important friend and, uh, and uh, country to the south. So uh, I would um, only uh, uh, say that we will be hearing uh, from each of our speakers in the order in which they appear in the program. <coughs> they have already uh, been, uh, been introduced uh, by, by Ambassador Darren Blum, and there are more extensive introductions of them uh, in the materials that you have. So I would like uh, to suggest that we would give each of the speakers about 15 minutes or so uh, to, to talk, uh, and, uh, and then we might have some time for discussion uh, among the group uh, here at the uh, table, but more importantly, we have in the audience uh, some very uh, uh, important and uh, extensive expertise <coughs> on all of the topics that we're dealing with. <coughs> so this can be a very important and, uh, and useful uh, dialogue. Now, uh, one final point, and that is that there was reference made to the sm snow flurries here Morning. If you really want to see what snow looks like, come up to Boston. <laughs> we, I have not been able to be back up there in two and a half weeks because of the snow. Every time I try to get back up, the flights are canceled or the trains are slowed, so I've stayed away from the place. Uh, and uh, so, so they're expecting more over the weekend. Uh, so in any event, consider yourselves lucky down here in D.C., Balmy, D.C. So let's go now, uh, first of all, to Luis Rubio, uh, who uh, will be our first uh, speaker. Um, thank you very much, Professor Falsgraf, and thank you for the invitation, Jaime. Um, let me start by saying that President uh, Peña never attained uh, high levels of popularity or recognition inside Mexico, anything uh, similar to what happened with the foreign media or other uh, people around. Um, his numbers at best uh, hovered around 50%, then they came to 40%, and now they are well below that. That, um, of course, uh, those numbers in Mexico stood uh, and, 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 and no longer stand in contrast with the rest of the world, probably, but they stood in stark contrast with expectations, the positive expectations that, that Ken in his introduction was mentioning. Uh, the fact that there was uh, the expectation that things would, would change quite radically. The question is why uh, this has happened. Did something suddenly go wrong? Can 43 um, uh, deaths explain such a shocking change 
of trends in a country that has uh, seen more than 120,000 uh, killings in the last uh, six or seven or eight years. Uh, it's it's hard to believe that that something uh, as and I don't mean to diminish the importance of every, any and every life, but can can something uh, can that number change everything? I would propose that the problems lie elsewhere. First, on in the frame of reference that the president came uh, up with in in his um, uh, his program, his strategy of, of government. The other is in the nature of the on the origin of the reformist pro program that the president pursued from the beginning. So let me start uh, with the frame of reference, where I see two components. First, uh, his experience as, as governor, and second, the role model that he uh, decided to pursue. In terms of frame of reference, Mexico is a, is a country of extremely weak institutions. Uh, it has been historically so. Presidents come and go, and they, they reinvent the wheel every six years. Uh, they create and, and destroy institutions as they please. Um, NAFTA is an interesting case in point. NAFTA was meant, was created precisely to address the weakness of institutions. It was a way to, f to, to guarantee, to confer guarantees upon investors that the government, the Mexican government, would not issue uh, vicious regulations, uh, they would not uh, choose favorites for, for among, among businesses or investors, uh, that there would be no capricious expropri expropriations and so on. Uh, the, the, the point is simply that NAFTA was a way to get around the nature of Mexican politics. It created very strong institutions guaranteed by the U.S. and, and Canadian governments, and that conferred enormous guarantees upon, upon uh, investors, and that has actually been the only truly strong engine of growth of the Mexican economy for the last uh, 20 years. Enrique Peña Nieto um, never held a federal office. He's the pre first president in Mexico's modern history and probably in Mexico's altogether history that never held a federal office. He came as a, from being governor uh, of an important state, but nonetheless of a of a state that is far away uh, uh, philosophically, politically from from the politics of of the country. Um, in a, again, in a country of weak institutions, therefore the president has an enormous impact on what happens. Governors play by the traditional rules in the sense that, that they can change things as they please. And in, in, at the state level, the governors are even more powerful than, than, a, than the old presidency used to be. Uh, so corruption is a way of life in most of the states, and which is nothing new or exceptional, but it simply uh, is seen and, and is part of, of the way of doing business, and therefore it, it extrapolates easily to the federal government. The administration, as I mentioned, came straight from being from from the governorship, um, and in a way, some of its ways and actions reflect those realities. Because despite all the the overall institutional weakness of the country, the federal level of government is far less corrupt than the states are. Not because people are better at the, at the federal level; it's simply because it's much more uh, uh, difficult to govern because there are many de facto checks on, on government power. There are many uh, civil organizations, there are business groups, there are unions. Um, there are all sorts of, of interest, uh, interests and, and mechanisms, most of them informal, that, that make it impossible or very difficult to play the same game that is played at the state level. There are, for instance, against corruption, uh, there are rules for absolutely everything that make it very cumbersome to issue uh, contracts, to issue concessions, to issue uh, um, uh, um, uh, bids for, for contracts for, for Pemex or for whatever else. Uh, that doesn't mean that they diminish the corruption, but it, but it requires an enormous process of management uh, to get there, something that, that is alien to most of the people who came in with, with President Peña, because they were not used to that. They were used to simply issuing contracts the way they, they had always done. So the clash was, to a large extent, inevitable. And it was seen from the very early uh, days of the administration, where it took them uh, many, many months to, to find out how to spend the money, simply to use the budget for their own uh, objectives. It was very difficult for them to, to uh, acknowledge and, and follow the rules for which they were not used. Then, more important, they began to alienate groups and players 
uh, uh, both at the within the political system as well as a, an, um, among um, businesses, they began to censor the media. They began to try to control uh, uh, what was being uh, written. They would began to to try to recreate an old presidency, and that's the point of of the model I was uh, uh, mentioning as the second component of the president's frame of reference. Um, my take is that when he came into the presidency, President Peña basically said. Today, Mexico is is uh, uh, Mexico's economy is not growing. Uh, there's the society is in, in total disarray and disorder. Uh, there's violence and crime. Whereas 50 years ago, the, the economy was booming. The the political system worked. The uh, there was order. There was no violence. What's the difference? A very strong government. So he very quickly um, and this very rough uh, comparison led to the strategy that 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 the government attempted to implement, which is to establish the government, the presidency particularly above society, where the president is more distant, uh, uh, more distant uh, from, the, from the people than, than traditionally or than the last 30 or 40 years had been, um, where the government, uh, by being there and being so powerful, was able to maintain security. Um, and it worked for a while. Uh, Passing the reforms proved to be uh, a uniquely skillful uh, play by the president. Uh, he proved the worthiness of, of the new strategy, except for two flaws. Uh, one is that he alienated everybody. Uh, he alienated every single power group in society. He alienated every interest in society. And many people who have no interest simply simply were uh, felt threatened, felt uh, alienated, felt outside the, the, the game. Um, and more important, it didn't, these, these reforms, uh, some of them uh, long-range reforms, of course, uh, did not lead to a stronger economy, less violence, or higher popularity on the president. Um, which leads me to the point of where the idea of reforming came from. And there's a paradox here. The mantra in the last 20 years or so in Mexico has been that, and I mean, uh, among specialists, uh, politicians, uh, academics, opinion makers, and so on, has been that, uh, see that if, if, if Mexico passed a series of reforms, at least was more or less agreed upon, uh, then uh, the country would immediately pass into nirvana, as it were. Never mind that there was no agreement on the content of what the reforms would have, not even, there was no even agreement on what the problem was that these reforms were supposed to address. And more important, there was no understanding or agreement, and I mean uh, among the broadest uh, um, echelons of, of, of the political world, uh, of the complexities of implementation. And many of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons why many of these reforms had not been uh, passed was because of the, of the interest that, that, that made reforming necessary, but were powerful enough to hinder and make it very difficult to reform. So, mm, what I see, I saw happening is that today's president, who grew up politically in those 20 years, um, accepted the notion that the reforms were necessary. Uh, and he knew full well what had to be done. And, and he's a uniquely qualified political operator. He's, after, after three presidents who, who were not politicians, something probably unique in Mexico's uh, history, uh, President Peña proved to be enormously capable at twisting arms, at buying off uh, people, at, at making everybody uh, come together into, into the Pact of Mexico, which was not his idea, was another po political party's idea, but nonetheless, he took advantage of it uh, successfully. But I don't believe that the president ever realized the complexities uh, and the implications of, of affecting deeply entrenched interests, many of which, probably most of which, are within the purview of, the, of his own party simply because of history, not for any other reason. Pemex was controlled by the by, by, by interest with the pre, uh, and therefore uh, the union, uh, the, the, the internal bureaucracy, the contractors, and so on, all of them play the game of maintaining the status quo, which is what, what helps their interests. So the problems began uh, with the implementation of the reforms. Uh, the minute that they began to affect or at least threaten interests, uh, they began to, to, to call into question the viability of the reforms. 
just one example, the educational reform, which was one of the earliest ones, which is not a perfect reform, but nonetheless it at least brought the idea of evaluating teachers uh, uh, with standardized, I'm sorry, students with standardized tests and, uh, and, and uh, rewarding or not teachers on the basis of the results. Um, I, I, a pretty neat idea, by the way. Um, but many of these of these sections of the union of the T union of teachers began to rebel against it, and the first thing that the government did was to concede exceptions to everybody who raised hell. So by the time the reform was supposed to be applied, it would only apply to those places who needed no reform because they were doing it anyway, as it were the modern Mexico, not the not the more entrenched uh, old Mexico where the problem of, re of education is far more serious. More important, the government was more concerned as of not uh, affecting interests, um, particularly those close to it, uh, and that led to to three things. First, all these grievances that kept on accumulating. Uh, there were few allies uh, of the government. The president didn't uh, spend any time in building a coalition, building sources of support uh, among. Uh, the business community or among the, the media or among uh, uh, opinion <coughs> makers or the like, um, or the unions. So a, a growing opposition in every regard for very different reasons, everyone, um, and more important, often by non-institutional players who are just hovering around waiting for an opportunity to, to, uh, to attack, as it were. This is what was brewing. So it was, they were, they, it was a situation that just waiting for a trigger to, to explode. Uh, and it was not very difficult to predict that something would happen. What would happen, I certainly didn't, didn't fathom. The deaths in Iguala, those 43 um, students, uh, were not the issue. Uh, it was only a trigger that made it possible for all those grievances, all those sources of opposition, all those people who were opposed for good reasons or, or, or bad reasons to come out of hiding uh, and express their fears, their opposition, whatever. There were more some some groups, some interests that were far more vocal, far more strategically placed. Some of them wanted to to have the president resign. Um, there was an issue, specific issue of a date, in which if the president had resigned, new elections would have to call for in, in, in because of the way the constitution <coughs> calls it. So the other thing is that for a government bent on controlling everything. Iguala had the effect of paralyzing the, pre the president and the government. And we haven't, for all practical purposes, we haven't seen the, the government act since September 26, when these events took place. And they came together with other things, the, 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 um, the, the cases of corruption of, of the house of this or the house of the other, um, uh, the, or, or some of, of the contracts that the government was issuing uh, proved to be, uh, to at least to, there, there was a, a big smell of corruption. Uh, and unfortunately, the government reacted in a way that he could have reacted in, 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 a, in one of two ways, either um, uh, how do I fix this problem or who did this to me. And the government still four and a half months or so later is still in who did this to me. Uh, so there is no, not, not even an attempt to fix the problem. So what does this vote for the future? First, I think we're back to square one. Uh, Mexico's problem is not one of drugs or crime or corruption. Mexico is Mexico has a problem, a huge deficit of government. Uh, Mexico's government is too weak to fulfill its mandate. The Mexican system of government, not this government, in general, the, the system of government, minimum by that the obvious, it cannot guarantee security, it cannot guarantee that there's a, 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 a formal, proper procedure for conducting business, uh, for the rule of law. In general, for creating conditions for progress to be possible, for people to live a decent life, meaning by that order, the economy, infrastructure, uh, the legal and judicial uh, framework in, in general, those things appear to work in, in the past, not because Mexico had them, had institutional strength, but because it was an authoritarian government that by the rule of rule worked effectively, even if six years at the time, sometimes better, sometimes worse. <coughs> in one work, Mexico has too weak a system of government uh, that became obvious once the, the, there was alternation of parties in government in 2000 and as it were the pre and the presidency divorced. Uh, and 
with in the absence of the of the of the of the ability to use the party to a guaranteed implementation of government the president's decisions everything came apart so now um, that now the new situation provides incentives for more noise and more um, uh, demands to be processed and if current trends persist the next four years i believe till election that's 2018 will be ever more complex and ever more dangerous on the other hand a few changes mostly of individuals could could redirect the administration to a sustainable pattern so even though i think that if one extrapolates from today's reality today meaning february 12 uh the the scenarios look dire um, if tomorrow there were th there was a change of a few key functionaries things could look very different so uh, i don't think this is catastrophic it could be catastrophic but i don't believe it is uh, even even uh, if and more important if the president were willing to take a much more ambitious uh, idea and do um, as it were um, it, in the equivalent of, of nixon goes to china and change the, the the introduce a game changer um and i have some ideas for that he could he could do uh, he could introduce a radical uh, uh, transformation and could f lay the foundation for something much better for the future my specific proposal uh, is if he were to assume the rule of law and to because he because of his own personal past uh, uh, to to accept that there is a need to change quite radically the way things are and because of his unique abilities to ma to manage the political process as a political operator things could change quite quite quickly quickly and quite well um, in one one word and with that I'll finish Mexico, I believe, is at a defining moment um, with <coughs> radically extreme scenarios uh, in sight, and it, it, they could be from one extreme to the other. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, th this, is, uh, <laughs> this is a very sober uh, and uh, in many ways pessimistic assessment. We will now hear from uh, Hector Chamis. Would you like to proceed? Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, Jaime, for the invitation. Uh, but you, you, you have given me a tremendous responsibility because I'm the only non-Mexican here speaking about Mexico. And you sat me in between the Mexicans, moreover, <laughs> which are going to scrutinize my intervention pretty harshly, obviously. Uh, aside from this, no, I... Mexico is a place I love. It's a place I've written about quite a bit. It's a place I've been visiting you know, almost every year for the last uh, 20 or so. Uh, and, uh, and and I think I can say a few things. I was just there in, in December. Uh, I think I can say a few things um, uh, of interest, I hope. Uh, so I have... Uh, four problems that uh, I want to address, and which are interconnected, and I'm going to try to make, the, make them flow together uh, in a good way. The first problem I want to talk about is Iguala. Uh, if there is a meeting here on Mexico uh, today, if, if people talk about Mexico and around the world, it's because of Iguala. Uh, the killing, the first disappearance, then killing of 43 students in a small town in the state of Guerrero. Uh, and Iguala was not the first massacre, was not unique, uh, wasn't even the, the largest in, in terms of the number of victims uh, of what has become uh, unfortunately routine in Mexico and in many other places in Latin America, which is the the, the intervention of organized crime and transnational crime in, uh, in territorial control, let's put it that way. Therefore, uh, organized crime turned into a political force. But Iguala was a signifier. Iguala made it to the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, European newspapers. Uh, El País itself uh, <coughs> sent people to Jan Martinez, by the way, Jan Martinez Harens, uh, chief correspondent of El País uh, in Mexico, was the first one to actually made it to the mass uh, graves. 
and, and document that with the photographs and everything. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it's, uh, it's one of those events, one of those anthropologists, again, I'm not an anthropologist, but anthropologists talk about signifiers, uh, oftentimes sociologists as well, and Igual is a signifier. The, the before and after, the watershed. Uh, well, uh, we cannot talk about Mexico the same way we used to before Iguala, after Iguala. Uh, and Iguala had uh, what I think two, uh, two dramatic messages, uh, two messages that had to do with the government. Uh, first message is that, and this is, you know, civil society. There, there are all the hashtags out there. First one, fue el Estado. It was the state. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that the collusion between organized crime and political authorities uh, was of such level, was of such depth, that it was a total, uh, not just a, not, not a collusion, but it, it, it was a, a mimesis. One became the other. And that was apparent, uh, actually, when the mayor of Iguala and his wife uh, went on the run and were themselves recognized as the, as the material uh, authors, the, the, the culprits, the material culprits of the disappearance of the 43 students, uh, turning them, ordering the municipal police to turn them over to the criminal organization to the Guerreros Unidos, the, the cartel. Uh, the unfortunate word of the state, the state is Guerrero and the, the NGO of uh, the cartel is Guerreros Unidos, uh, which is you know, particularly unfortunate. Puel Estado was a, a, a signifier of this story made by civil society itself on El Zócalo. Uh, one of the several nights of uh, massive uh, rallies and mobilizations around this issue. Uh, the, the second unfortunate uh, hashtag was Jame uh, Canse, which was a phrase pronounced by the Procurador General, the Attorney General of Mexico, in a press conference uh, where he informed reporters on the country and the world of what had happened. Uh, and the, after the second question, uh, second or third question by reporters in the, during the press conference, he looked on the side and his body language was quite, quite revealing. He looked on the side, he talked to an aide who was on the side of the stage and said, bueno, basta, ya me cansé. Okay, enough now, I'm tired. And that became a hashtag. And that reveals something absolutely uh, dramatic uh, for a country, uh, which is, uh, this is this, the Attorney General trying to find justice, the truth and justice, and do justice to victims. Uh, and he was tired. Uh, and, and the state doesn't have the luxury of getting tired. But, but the, the, the Attorney General's, the Procurador General's uh, body language and his words were revealing of that, uh, that state declaring itself ultimately incompetent. Uh, this is uh, painfully true. Uh, Luis addressed some of those issues, I think. But it's also painfully true in terms of a state that uh, m has, in a way, completely abandoned uh, civil society. Uh, Perhaps not in the the EFE, not in Mexico City, where things are different, but it doesn't take uh, too much trouble uh, out of the capital to get into these nowhere lands, in which the exercise of the exercise of political authority is at best confused, where subnational states, the states, the, the provincial entities, but in Mexico it's like in the states, it's uh, like in the U.S., is states. Uh, at the subnational level, the, the interpenetration, interpenetration between organized crime and political power is of such magnitude that uh, people don't know anymore uh, who is who, which is which. Uh, 
there is an there is a column in El País today by by the way Carlos Lauria, uh, the head of America's program at the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, uh, about another municipality uh, on on the same issue, uh, the the hard life of journalists in Mexico trying to report cover and report uh, corruption and organized crime in their subnational units. And that was the, the, the sort of the, as I said, the before and after. Uh, the after was uh, the panel addresses uh, the issue of the president personally, Enrique Peña Nieto. Well, it was a, unfortunate, uh, the president's response to, to this tragedy. It was uh, out of touch. It was insensitive. Uh, it, it showed little empathy. He went to China in the middle of the crisis. He, he didn't appear in Guerrero. He didn't appear in Iguala at all. Uh, it appeared with, uh, again, sort of the state is tired and the president is unaccountable. The, 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 the government doesn't seem to understand the fundamental issue of accountability. Uh, death, mass a massacre uh, is a is a state issue. Uh, in, in that press conference, the Attorney General also said a particularly uh, disturbing phrase. He said, Guerrero no es el Estado Mexicano, he said. I'm, I'm quoting. Guerrero is not the Mexican state. It's like, uh, Guerrero is like uh, Scotland or Catalonia. I mean, Presumably, uh, it's an independent state, I mean, which are not, but uh, the issue of nationalism. There is no secession in Mexico. The, the buck stops at the federal government. And the federal government didn't take that buck, did not assume its responsibility and accountability. And then there was the issue that Luis addressed, <coughs> the issue of the White House uh, that added fuel to the fire, certainly. Uh, again, accountability, again, <coughs> the president didn't address himself a serious <coughs> accusation of corruption, uh, his wife addressed it. In the mansion itself, uh, showing so little empathy, so little connection with the magnitude of the tragedy that uh, people, humble people in Mexico were going through. She was in the mansion. Luxury could be seen in, the, in that press conference. Uh, and she was mad. She was annoyed. How dare you uh, accuse me? Uh, sort of using Luis's words, who, who did this to me? Uh, sort of, you know, in terms of corruption. And that was unfortunate. And that has, uh, in, in so many ways, uh, is explaining the dramatic uh, drop in popularity that the president has right now. Uh, but the, 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 this is the third thing that I, I would like to address uh, regarding this is that uh, it's not just Peña Nieto. It's the... Let me say a couple of things about the once hegemonic party, uh, PRI. Uh, PRI. Uh, there's a little bit of history here that I, I, I'm going to bother you. Uh, the party was in power, the PRI was in power, the Revolutionary Party was in, in, in power for 70 something years. Uh, uh, and there was always fraud. But there was always fraud so that the, the official party, the dominant party, would win with uh, 70, 80, 90 percent of the vote. The fraud was not n out of necessity to make it to Los Pinos, the, of the side of the executive, but it was out of greed, out of political greed, because uh, the Revolutionary Party couldn't have uh, 40 or 40 something percent of people in disagreement. Well, that changed in the 1988 election. The 1988 election where fraud was there again, but to make it to Los Pinos this time around. And that changed the game. Uh, Salinas was the candidate, uh, and he was challenged by Cárdenas, former <coughs> pre member, at the time with his. Uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the PRD. It was, it was the beginning of the PRD, but it had a. It, it, what? Cardenas. Cardenas, yeah. But, not, not in the but the, party, the party was not called PRD as it is now. But, uh, well, he challenged. Uh, Salinas was elected. Salinas sworn in with uh, half the House empty. Uh, it had never happened in, in Mexico's history. And that was the beginning of change. But at the same time, the beginning of the end 
of a particular way of doing politics. Uh, Salinas governed trying to extend the lifetime of a party that was dead. <coughs> and somehow he managed. He managed with NAFTA. Uh, he managed with a, a variety of uh, uh, active political initiatives. Uh, until in 94, uh, El Dedazo didn't work. El Dedazo is the appointment of uh, the president, of the incoming candidate by the sitting president. The first uh, appointed was the Donaldo Colosio, Colosio was assassinated. Uh, and then there was a second dedazo, a second appointment was needed, and that was Ernesto Cedillo. Uh, Cedillo was uh, strategic and intelligent enough to realize that the system could not resist. The system had to change, even if in the process the dominant party would lose power. This is interesting because those of us who were in grad school in the, in the 90s uh, always thought that Mexico could only govern by the PRI. There was a sort of a conventional wisdom in grad school. Well, Mexico is, is only the PRI can govern Mexico. Uh, but Cedillo democratized the country, created the IFE, now INE, uh, an independent institution to oversee voter registration and an administration of election, vote, vote counting, and so on. Uh, and the institution is became an example, in fact. My good friend, Bob Pastor, deceased, who was a student of uh, elections, used to talk about uh, IFE, now INE, as, as a model of an independent electoral institution, moreover, that the US should imitate. And he was right, actually. In the process, Mexico, lo uh, the PRI lost the election. And uh, the PAN, the opposition PAN, center-right PAN, came to office, uh, and came to office and nothing happened, which was good for Mexico. Well, Mexico democratized. There was alternation in power. The PAN was good or was bad. It, it depends on who you ask. Uh, but it wasn't the PRI, and nothing happened. Maybe things were the same as usual, but nothing happened in terms of a dramatic crisis. We were wrong. Mexico could be governed, or misgoverned, if you want, by someone else. And the PAN uh, spent two sexenios in office, 12 years. Uh, and now the PRI is back with Peña Nieto. The problem, as I see it, is that the PRI that is back is not the PRI that left Mexico in 2000. It's not the PRI of Ernesto Cedillo, who realized that, well, either we make this system democratic or we will all be uh, in, a, in a state of societal dissolution. Uh, well, the PRI that is back is more of the Salinas PRI. And that is complicated, we was, which was not that understanding of the necessity of democratization uh, for Mexico. Look at the, in so many ways, is this, the Salinas Pri is back, and, 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 and in many ways, the presidency of Peña Nieto is quite a, quite a copycat of the Salinas presidency. A spectacular jailing of uh, a corrupt union leader, uh, but only one not all corrupt union leaders, but only one. Uh, some uh, spectacular economic uh, business-oriented uh, announcement, Pemex privatization or Pemex marketization, depending on, on, the, on the final shape it takes. Um, a lot of political initiative, the pact, uh, that Mexican society doesn't quite understand what it means, other than the fact that it may be uh, some sort of political engineering to to secure uh, yet again the permanency of the PRI in power uh, for the foreseeable future. The problem is that the other two parties are in terrible shape. Uh, the PRD is practically dissolved, and correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. the PRD has, you know, as I read and talk to people and as I saw in Mexico in December, PR, the PRD, the center-left opposition, practically non-existence anymore. <laughs> And the PAN, the center-right opposition, uh, is in a quite, a quite a bit of trouble in terms of you know, the organization of internal politics and, and, a, and a leadership crisis. It's not this has not disappeared, but it's in a moment of crisis. And all of this is problematic because you may think, well, it's only the PRI left, and it's the hegemonic party politics all over again. Yes, except that there is another party in town that the old PRI didn't seem to realize 
until Iguala. The other party is, the, is organized crime. Uh, and the other party that exercises power, not in the Mexico City, not in the DF, not the federal government, but in the rest of the country, is organized crime. And it's more than one party. It's a very fragmented party system, uh, using that as a metaphor of the different cartels and the different segments of, of this uh, organization that are based on politics, are based on politics because their profits depend on territorial control. And that is what politics is, territorial control. This is problematic because there is a lot of literature out there by now that you can look uh, on subnational authoritarianism, on the fact that the Mexican transition to democracy was based on a deal, on a deal between the federal government at the center and the peripheral governments that remain authoritarian or became even more authoritarian than Mexico ever was. There is an article about the governor of Oaxaca uh, this week in the New York Times and his uh, properties in the United States, uh, Murat. And, uh, and Murat was, was one of the case studies, interestingly enough, state of Oaxaca and Murat was one of the original case studies in the early literature on subnational authoritarianism back in the 90s. Uh, so the, the, it, this was not the first time I saw his name uh, in, in the New York Times, yes, but not in, in, in the literature on, on Latin American democratic transitions. Uh, and this is bad news. This is bad news for Mexico because uh, it's one formal party, the PRI, with the bad habits, again, the, the, the bad habits of authoritarianism, not the better habits of Ernesto Cedillo and the democratization and the creation of institutions for the transition to democracy in Mexico, with a subnational authoritarian regime, a center surrounded uh, by uh, a variety of, a ring of mini uh, subnational authoritarian regimes, with one addition, this subnational authoritarianism is now a criminal subnational authoritarianism. And then the question becomes, how is this dramatic uh, tragedies, this dramatic security crisis going to be resolved? Is uh, the PRI going to make a deal with organized crime in the same way that local authorities made deals like in Iguala and in many other states uh, in the same way that those uh, subnational uh, political regimes made deals with the uh, organized crime. Questions abound. The answers I have very few. Uh, this is an electoral year, 2015. And I think we should be watching and see what comes out of that election. How does the uh, chamber, uh, both chambers look? And, uh, and what's the future for a true democratic politics in Mexico? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Hector. This is another uh, uh, rather pessimistic assessment of, of Mexico. And I don't know whether the same uh, line of reasoning and uh, argumentation will be carried on by our third and final speaker. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, Miguel uh, Bazanias, you are next. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad being here, and thank you very much for the invitation and for you coming here today. Uh, before starting, I want to place a question. The title of this conference, Peña Nieto Spend Force or Game Changer, I just wanted to mention that it's a question that has not been asked about a Mexican president since 1930, 85 years ago. So that is saying something about what's going on <coughs> in Mexico today. I would like to uh, cover quickly uh, four points. First, answering that question, uh, three scenarios, and then the Eisenhower warning, and then a turning tables. According to the image thus far propelled by the international press, uh, Peña Nieto is a, a spend force. We saw that article on the, the economy on November, and then followed by the question if Peña Nieto resigns as scenarios for government change in Mexico, and then in June, another article, and that's just three of those that has been. Now, 
looking back, the answer is he's a game changer. As he won a presidential election against the pre old guard, and also he succeeded on his electoral reform. So what's going on? Looking forward, the answer, I think, is subject to three possible scenarios. An optimistic, a pessimistic, and an intermediate and scenario. Let's go to those. The optimistic scenario would be one where the oil price bounces back, then Mexico's economy recovers, then a structural reform succeed, Peña Nieto turns the table, and the game changes. Probability of this one, 25%. The pessimistic scenario, not enough a scenario one happens, protests increase, of course, fueled by anti-corruption and Ayotzinapa movements. Uh, Peña Nieto is forced to resign. Organized crime prevails. I like what Hector said about organized crime as the fourth most powerful political party right now in Mexico. And then the sixth crisis happened. Probability of this one? Another 25%. The intermediate scenario is a combination of one and two. What combination? That, that is difficult, and I want to go on that. But the probability of this one, I think, is a 50%. This is a probable one. Now, this probable scenario is highly dependent on the internal political conflicts in the US. That's I guess. Now, let me uh, disclaimer. I've been teaching in Fletcher cultures and world development for the last seven years. So what both Luis and Hector are saying about Mexico, and they are working much closer than me, they know much better. So I yield to their opinions. So, but of course, as a Mexican, and I I am guilty of having introduced public opinion polling back in 88, and that's something that I did with Luis as well. So I've been following, but, but not as close as them. Now, if what I'm saying is correct, that the scenario is highly dependent on the internal political conflicts in the US, that is a problem. Unfortunately, the US political system is broken, and the U.S. value systems is broken too. Clearly, the Mexican party system is also broken. It works in the same dysfunctional steps of the U.S. party system. I would say both are equally a mess. Now, the American economy is not broken yet, but it is imploding. The U.S. today seems to me more and more like the sinking Titanic. Let me move into the Eisenhower warning on the sixth crisis. If market forces were to guide the outcome of the scenarios, I wouldn't be worried. But my fear is that that's not what is in play, that it may be rather the Eisenhower warning. And I did my PhD thesis on the first four crises of Mexico, 1968, 76, 82, 87, they all happen at the end of the presidential terms. And what is going on right now are, is very similar to those, except that this was in the second year. So it's no sustainable. The other comment is that what Mexico leave over the five decades, the US packed the whole thing in the last five years. So in the US, we have lived the outcome of the crisis in five years what in Mexico happened over five decades. Now, that research of my PhD thesis helped me to anticipate the Mexican, the fifth Mexican crisis, the tequila crisis of 1994. That is the front page of the magazine, a magazine that Luis and I and other colleagues founded 23 years ago, where I was questioning, is the fifth crisis coming, which it came, that happened. Now, 
The Mexican media kept asking me at the end of each presidential term since 2000 to write about the sixth crisis. But I kept, I, I answered that. My answer had been, I don't see it. But now I do. The Eisenhower, Eisenhower said on the military industrial complex, we recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend these grave implications. The US presidents cannot balance and counterbalance the complex, much less a G12 country as Mexico, and that's where Peña Nieto is currently, and that's what I want to check with you. That complex, this is my interpretation, was quite comfortable with the last Mexican presidents as um, the U.S. had not entered into a, a full-fledged new war. At least the drug wars in Mexico helped pay the bills. Let me move into turning tables. Unfortunately for the complex, the entrance of Peña Nieto changed things. And then I feel that a soft struggle began. The first sign, two weeks before inauguration, was stopping the nomination of the defense secretary. That was reported by Ginger Thompson in the New York Times on February 4th of 2013. The second sign, once week after the inauguration, uh, another case reported by Dana Priest in the Washington Post, and to make a simile, imagine that the Chinese ambassador summoning the U.S. Secretary of State, the House and Senate leaders, the NSA director up to his office. Well, you would say no way. Well, that's what Wayne did in Mexico in December 2012. Now, after that, the complex press really hard before the May 2013 Obama visit to Mexico to set the agenda of the two presidents' talks on three items. Security, security, and security. Obama and Peña had developed a good report, and they talk of everything except security. How come? The complex, that's my hypothesis, had to try something more effective. What about this credit in Peña in the international press? There was enough material, so why don't you just put the microscope and also a strong beam of light and let's make that very powerful. Now, let me be clear. I am not defending Ayotzinapa or the White House or the Querétaro train case. I completely agree with what Luis and Hector said on what needs to be done and what's going on in Mexico. So that's not the point. The point is that similar, if not worse, cases have happened in the past to administrations without triggering such a reaction. What is different now? I like what Hector says about there is one before and after Ayotzinapa. I, am, I was in school when the 1968 movement happened. I participated in the 1968 movement, and I fell in my own the before and after 68. And after almost 50 years, I felt the same with Ayotzinapa, that it was a turning point. So Ayotzinapa is not a tropical storm, as some have said. I feel it is more a tsunami with its epicenter in 1968. It seems to me, if my hypothesis is correct, that we are in a case of market share competition. The Mexican Department of Defense has historically built the Mexican army guns, and then Peña Nieto was said to return to that tradition, kind of a David and Goliath, and then, no way, Mexicans can not buy guns except in the US, and a disagreement could have begun. However, I have a concern. If the complex seeks on autopilot and the three hundred most powerful U.S. families are not in control, then, Houston, we have a problem. By removing the Mexican president from office, 
A6 crisis is possible, but the consequences for the U.S. in general would be even worse than the one that is just ending. The many American business partnering and investing in Mexico are also not powerful enough to counterbalance the complex. The inability, and that comes my greater concern, of the U.S. government and of the U.S. markets to counterbalance that complex if this fear of mine is right, is a risk for international order. So I am taking just the case of Mexico to make a reflection of international consequences. It may accelerate the coming of China to the forefront as a way to regain that order. Peña is trapped in such a dilemma. Peña and the Mexican government and the Mexican political system have made enough faults to allow that, but it's not only what is going on in Mexico. Friends help friends, but more to the point, it, I think it is in the best U.S. interest to help Mexico succeeding. Thank you very much. Well, now, now we have heard uh, each of the presentations, and uh, I would just ask the panel if anyone would like to say anything uh, to any other member of the panel uh, before we turn uh, to the uh, audience for uh, its uh, uh, interventions. Would anyone like to make any comments on the, these issues that we've been talking <coughs> about? So let's start with uh, questions from uh, the, uh, the group assembled here. Who would like to go first? Please. And identify, wait for the microphone and identify yourself, please. I wanted to, thank you. I'm Dave Murray, I'm, I'm here at Hudson. I was just struck the, the speech, oh, excellent by the way, very illuminating, powerful, and very troubling portrayals, thank you very much. The parallel, set aside for the moment the great differences that we could spend much time on, Colombia comes to mind. Is there a possible way of identifying lessons for where not to go, where to go, with regard to the Alvaro Uribe period in Colombia, with regard to crime, instability, elites, the paramilitaries, the threats to national security, the drug context, TOCs in a different form? I, is there a way to learn from that, or is Mexico totally different? and there's simply no leadership dimension possible there. Who would like to tackle that question? Shall we take uh, two or three and then we answer? We can do that as well. Uh, would you, who would like to ask the next question and then we'll ask the panel to address uh, two or three questions <coughs> uh, right away. Uh, Herbert Francisco Curriarcel from Merida, Yucatan. Uh, just two things, one on the role that local legislatures, state-level legislatures might play in changing the dynamics in, in political play in Mexico. And the second point, and, and this goes to uh, Mr. Chamis's comment about the three parties, and what is the role within the PRI? Are there, you know, what are the internal dynamics within the PRI that might add some energy to the system and push it in a different direction than what, w what seems to be the case at the moment? Thank you. Shall we take one more, and then we'll let the panel talk for a while about uh, as it thinks about these questions? Bernardo Rico, the World Bank. Excellent presentations. I, I just kind of wanted to reconcile a little bit what seems some of the differences between what Luis was talking about and Hector. Luis, you seem to, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, focusing a lot on the Peña Neto administration or her inability to actually govern properly in, the, in this particular point in history in Mexico. And I agree with you, it's Mexico's problems are ones of governance and not necessarily of crime and violence and drugs particularly. But then, Hector, you seem to be focusing a lot, obviously, about the second or fourth party, however you refer to it as organized crime and their claims over territory. And I'm trying to understand, is it re I don't want to you know, apportion more blame to one side, but is it really, is it really one of Peña Neto's inability to kind of govern through this period of time, or is it one deeper than that, and Mexico really needing to kind of institutionalize uh, the country? Hector, would you like to begin? Um, <coughs> yeah, le let me say just uh, a couple of things quickly and then uh, turn to my co-panelists. Uh, first about Colombia. 
uh, well, the the, the one uh, issue in in Colombia that Mexico doesn't have, uh, when when people talk about the heavy-handed uh, Uribe administration, his uh, ability to uh, curb uh, the power of uh, organized crime, the guerrillas, etc. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's also remember that Uribe wanted to stay a third term. Uh, he reformed the Constitution <coughs> to get himself reelected to a second consecutive term. That was not in the, in the Colombian Constitution. He wanted to do it for, for a third consecutive term. The Constitutional Tribunal rejected that. Uh, I'm saying this as, a, as an example, as an illustration of something that will not happen in Mexico in those terms, but it does highlight the, in the end, the value of Colombian institutions over, uh, over Mexican institutions. Not that anybody would want to alter, I can't imagine, but correct me if you see it otherwise, uh, nobody will want to alter the, the six-year term and, and modify that and uh, install some sort of re-election perpetuation in office that is so common to, to Latin America, to other Latin American countries, to most other Latin American countries. But, but uh, I'm saying this just as a sort of, you know, a, uh, a, a caution, uh, some, some skepticism about the, the success of uh, Colombia in the end in organized crime, FARC now, to a great extent, it's based on the, in the end, in spite of that violence, in spite of that fragmentation, on some fundamental institutions having fundamental importance in the operation of a political system. And the judiciary is one of them. And again, the Constitutional Tribunal rejected perhaps who was the most powerful president in the last 40, 50 years in his attempt to, to stay in office. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, uh, the, the, what I see the problem as the PRI, and, and then I stop, and, is that the PRI didn't realize that when the PRI came to office, the, the, the way I see it, the, the PRI came back to office 2012, and as if was not aware of what had happened in Mexico in, in the 12 years uh, in between, in the 12 years of a PAN in office. And it was a completely different Mexico. It, it, it is as if the PRI it appeared that they wanted to govern making the old, the old deals, the old deals of clientelism, the old deals with the caciques and the politics as usual, the, the old PRI machinery that wouldn't work anymore, wouldn't work in this new Mexico because of the existence of uh, new political actors, not only new, uh, this what I call this political party with quotation marks, uh, uh, organized crime, uh, which is, again, many, because it's a very fragmented system of territorial control with, by the way, a competition between them, among them, for that territorial control, which is competition not necessarily <coughs> based on votes, but based on, on bullets. Uh, but it's also that Mexico e emerged from these 12 years with a completely different civil society, with different and uh, new social movements, with different demands, with different... Uh, the different degrees of uh, civil society involvement. And the PRI, it, it, it is as if, among other things, Iguala, Yotzinapa was a wake-up call. Uh, that's what's worrisome. The ability of the PRI to understand that the country is a different country from where they left it. Uh, uh, this is not back to the old you know, 70 years of hegemonic party. There's no, no hegemony anymore. They lost two sexenios, but, of course. But they, they've been running the country in, in the old fashion, uh, very much like a Salinas uh, program, very much, well, the Salinismo is part of you know, this presidency, very much so. Uh, it's been documented by everybody. Uh, but it's also as if it was enough with some spectacular decisions and dealing with the caciques. Well, the, the caciques are part of, the, of organized crime. The mayor of Iguala and his wife were the ones, these are the <coughs> exercise territorial control, not on behalf of any party, but on behalf of Guerreros Unidos, the cartel. Uh, and that is, you know, how to deal with that is something that they don't seem to have figured out. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and, and if, if you guys want to address the, 
the other one, the PRI, internal PRI issues or yeah. something. Luis, would you like Luis to intervene at this point on <coughs> any of these uh, questions and give us your thoughts? Thanks, Robert. Um, well, a little bit on, on each one of, of the questions. Um, the dynamics are different from Colombia. Uh, they are simply for, because Mexico is, because in Colombia there's, there's where much of the production takes place. Uh, but I believe that there are three lessons that are important. One is that it's an effective government, real governance that is, is critical, and that's what two or three uh, Colombian administrations built over the years and Uribe capitalized and, and concluded, um, creating much stronger institutions along the way. So, so they have the, the, the fundamentals, they built the fundamentals for order to be reestablished, for something that Mexico has not even begun to fathom. Um, and I could go into specific details. Uh, they regain control of the territory by advancing little by little. They still have uh, some, some, some way to go, but nonetheless, they advance that by building strong institutions, a strong military, and so on. The other side is that um, Colombia is a unitary state. There, there, are no, there are no states, so, so, so the decisions at the central government can be imposed everywhere, something Mexico has much more trouble with. Uh, but no question in my mind that the solution that, that uh, led to the success of Colombia has to do with very strong leadership and very strong clear-mindedness that led to the development of that. Uh, in that, Colombia is, is a great example, not necessarily very followed in Mexico, but the, the Mexico has followed some specific policies for security, but nothing else. On organized crime, um, I... I, if, if one looks at, the, at organized crime as a business, which it is, um, uh, they are not in the business of governing. They use local governments for their purposes. In some cases, they put the local government. In some cases, they replace the local government. In some cases, they are shadow government. But they are not in the business of governing itself. In some cases, the same individual may, be, may play both games, as was proven in Iguala, which apparently has become the, the, the center of heroin production uh, for the US, U.S. market. Um, but I think it's the economics of organized crime that really matter. Something where the U.S. government focusing that way would be able to help much more than it can at present. And, and for, for a very simple reason, the security crisis in Mexico of the last uh, 10 or 12 years originated in two, in two, in two uh, moments or in two circumstances. One is that power in Mexico has been decentralizing for the last several decades, but it experienced its sudden um, uh, decentralization with what I term the, 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 the divorce of the PRI and the, and the, and the presidency after the, the, the uh, defeat of PRI in 2000. Um, at that time, all that power that was concentrated there flowed to the governorships, to the leaders of the political parties. So Mexico became a very decentralized country and power was dispersed all over the place. That had the benefit of of making big crises impossible. So crises became local events rather than big national issues. This new government has tried to re-centralize, never in the way that, that the old pre uh, existed, but nonetheless, that's why it's paying a big price for having centralized because it's, 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 it's become the, the, the culprit for everything uh, that happens. The other thing, and it's not not some not not well, and, and more important, the, the local governments never invested, even though they they, get, they got much more budget. They never invested in local police forces. They never invested in judiciary. And therefore, the result is that there's much less security, uh, or a much weaker or non-existent security <coughs> apparatus, much of it at the local level penetrated by the, by the um, uh, drug mafias. The other side that is not, not any less important is that 9-11 created a dramatic change in the Mexican reality. Uh, by hardening the border, the U.S. forced the local, uh, the, the the cartels, to create new mechanisms to to bring the the, the stuff into the U.S. So, it, whereas there were many entry points, and that led to competition um, among the cartels to bring the stuff into the U.S., 9/11 provoked the, a concentration of power among the cartels and some fragmentation within the cartels, but nonetheless with the same objective, um, and that uh, all that made it they, they, that forced the Mexican cartels to develop, they, imagine the, the cartels as, as UPS or FedEx, they were in the business of bringing stuff. Now they have a humongous hurdle to cross the border, so they had they developed 
something that the Colombians are used to, which is a territorial presence along the border and to, in the roads that lead to the border. If you look at the, at the crime and the patterns of crime, they are all related to the, the border, the, the, the coasts where the, the stuff comes uh, from the south, and the roads that lead to the border. So I think that there's a lot that, that both countries can do. Um, in the differences between what Hector said and, uh, and I, the only, the only difference that I would emphasize is that I think that Peña is, is really looking back to the 1950s, not to Salinas. I, I don't think, the, the, the reforms, yes, associate them, but not, not, not the individuals, not the projects. Uh, Peña's hero is a former president of Mexico that happens to be the only president from his home state, Adolfo López Mateos, a president from 58 to 64. I think that's the model that he started to, to rebuild and recreate. Uh, ev everything else that, that, that uh, Hector said, uh, I, I agree with. But the important thing is that Salinas already lived in a very convulsed world uh, that needed reforming, whereas what this group pretends is to recreate an era in which there was no, 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 there were no issues, there was no disorder, there couldn't be disorder, there was no disorder elsewhere. It was the era of the of the of the, of the uh, uh, Cold War, and there was there was a to it was at a totally different structure of reality. Many of the issues of to that Mexico confronts today are the result of of a very poor. Uh, implementation of decisions that were made in the late 1990s. Uh, democracy is very nice, but it led to an enormous disorder because it was never brought to the country at large. It was an imposition at the top. Yes, we have a very nice electoral institutions, but that doesn't mean that those electoral institutions work at the local level. It doesn't mean that the governors which suddenly uh, became very powerful because of the changes I just uh, mentioned in the power structure of the country. Uh, they had to implement those decisions that they decided not to. So they became fiefdoms, independent fiefdoms. Some, some politician once mentioned that Mexico is the only country in the world that went uh, from, from a, um, let me get the, the right, um, um, that, that, that went from, from the Renaissance to, to feudalism. Mm. And, and, the, and, the, and the reason is simply that the new uh, warlords in Mexico are the governors, and they have they have hindered uh, every single uh, um, uh, change from from happening that is happening at other levels of, of the gov of the of the country. So I think that the the the, the changes that Cedillo implement that Cedillo advanced are not necessarily that successful, simply because we didn't build the structure to make them possible. Okay, uh, Miguel, would you like to... Uh, find on the three questions uh, that were asked, I found one common thread, which is uh, rule of law. Mexico v will not be able to overcome all these problems if the rule of law is not established. And that reminds me, back in 1988, when um, uh, the group that we were uh, pushing for public opinion polling, and began to, to emerge a big enthusiasm of civil society behind what we were doing, that, that was a very active uh, period in current times. But after that produced the opening up of the system and finally the alternancy in 2000, Civil society in Mexico seemed to have gone to, became very quiet and kind of feeling that just by getting into alternancy, having won pan the presidency in 2000, everything would change and that was enough and then kind of withdraw. And that was a big mistake. Since then, I've been thinking what could reactivate civil society to push harder on and keep on the, the changes that Mexico needs. And in 2008, uh, Fox brought a constitutional change to introduce oral trials and moving from the Roman legal system to the adversarial Anglo-Saxon system and that process is on the way, and I find in oral trials the same power that I found 
back in the 80s on public opinion polling. Public opinion polling made transparent what the voting had been. And all trials make transparent what the justice system is. But there is a lot of opposition. And that is an example of moving forward the rule of law in Mexico. And that's one of the key points that I would say could help solve the current situation. We now, thank you, Miguel. We now have uh, time for another uh, round of questions, and then I'll give the panel the final word on, on these, uh, these questions that now uh, are, are hopefully on the agenda for next. Who would like to begin with a, another question? Hi, thank you. I'm Andreas Ross with the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. So I'm a German reporter based in Washington trying to understand Mexico. Um, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Um, you have found some pretty critical words of the governors, um, both of you. You've just called them sort of the new warlords of Mexico. Um, and you, Hector, have also made clear that um, the president of Mexico is uniquely positioned to understand that particular power and, and the endemic corruption in many of the states. How then uh, should I understand his proposal to strengthen the state level by giving, by sort of centralizing police forces on that level is a question that's puzzling me. And if, if I follow things correctly, that proposal doesn't seem to be going anywhere anyway. So um, if you could um, enlighten us a little bit on what kind of proposals are there, if any, in terms of security reform at this point after Iguala, uh, and if anything, any other proposals have any chances of going anywhere. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who would like to ask another question? Please, right over here, the lady over here. My name is Joe Freeman. This may be a little off the left field, but I'd like to know if NAFTA has had any impact on the problems you describe, or alternatively, if those problems have had any impact on NAFTA. Another, another question? Please, here we up, up in the front row here. John Zemko with the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, taking from that, segueing from that last question, maybe you can address a little bit what, from a U.S. policymaking perspective, what can the U.S. do to try to, you know, create some resolution or some forward positive movement in this scenario that you painted that's fairly bleak? Very good. And, and I have, uh, I have a, a question as well. Uh, M Miguel, you said that uh, oil prices uh, could bounce back. May, are you, are you, is that in your optimistic scenario? If oil prices bounce back. What I wanted to ask uh, is, is uh, the panel's assessment of the trends now in the Mexican economy, uh, and, and if those trends uh, are likely to have uh, adverse effects upon the economy in Mexico, which will lead uh, to a further uh, problem of uh, exodus from Mexico to uh, uh, get better jobs in the United States, to find employment here. Uh, it, thus spilling over into the endemic problem that we have in our relationship with Mexico. So I wanted to add that into the, into the mix. And I have lots of other questions, but I won't even get to those because we're talking to the audience here. Okay. So that would, is, is there any other question that someone has? Because this is probably the last time, yeah. last round that we'll have with the group here. So how would you like to proceed in answering those questions in the same order the same as order, before? Same. Okay, that would get have Hector going first. Okay, um, I just want to address the issue of centralization and the governors and so on, or which, which is decentralization, is, is, is to, to increase the power of, of the states. Uh, Mexico is a federation, we know that, and that is already uh, quite a bit of uh, a dynamic that decentralizes power. Uh, I think that uh, that local is uh, better is a question, is an empirical question. Uh, it can never be an assumption. Uh, sometimes local is better, sometimes it's not. I honestly can't see how uh, giving more power to the governors uh, could uh, help resolve the security crisis when they already have power. Uh, Perhaps uh, the government is thinking in terms of taking power away from the municipalities to the governors. I don't. Th 
I, I can't see it will make a difference. I mean, this is one of those situations in which a difference will come from the center, and the center is the federal government. Uh, that's, uh, in general, I think uh, we've been preaching decentralization in general, administrative, fiscal, uh, territorial, for too many years. And oftentimes, one of, one of the lessons of all these studies on subnational authoritarianism is how much that decentralization has contributed to consolidate the power of those local elites uh, who were hardly ever democratic, uh, precisely. And then the ways in which that became functional for the center, sort of, you know, the political bargain between the center and the periphery, uh, you keep your own mess there, don't bring it to the capital city, don't bring it to me. Uh, but that has now dramatically changed with Iguala because the mess of the, everybody knew, it, it had been going on in different parts of Mexico, but now Iguala is that crisis blowing up uh, in the in the DF, in, the, in El Zócalo, with society um, in so many ways uh, overwhelmed by, by this ongoing and accumulative, uh, accumulating uh, security crisis. Thank you. Hmm? Um. I don't see any solution from the central government. I think, uh, but I don't. I don't. I agree totally with Hector in that uh, giving more power to the governors makes no sense. The, I, I think that it's exactly the opposite. It has to come from the bottom. Um, there are success. There are two successful cases. Uh, one being Nuevo León, Monterrey, specifically not Nuevo León. The other being uh, Tijuana. Very different models. Very different origin and structure. Uh, but both are now beginning to expand to the rest of the states. So it is a new type of police, a new relationship between society and um, and the police forces and the local government that is forcing a change. Uh, the interesting thing is that when the, the crisis in Michoacán exploded uh, in early in this administration, just that it had with, with Calderón, um, what they did was to resort to the old pre -style of sending... Uh, as it were, a proconsul to to uh, mm -hmm. full with a, with a bag full of money to simply spread the money around, uh, only to find that there was more insecurity at the end of the two years that just uh, uh, that just took place and, and this this proconsul was fired. Um, I don't see. I think that the only solution, the long term solution, is to developing a totally new approach to police force and security. And and again, there are two very successful cases. NAFTA. Uh, was a way for Mexico to borrow institutions, to borrow U.S. institutions, and it works, and that works perfectly. What I think Mexico needs is to expand that that concept to the rest of the country. I just published a little book uh, arguing precisely that NAFTA was meant to be a solution for investors. I think that we need a NAFTA for Mexican citizens. Uh, everybody should have to enjoy the same institu institutional strength. I don't mean to say that the U.S. government should intervene there. I, I simply means, mean that, to, that we need the same type of guarantees and security, institutional security, legal security for all Mexicans. The other side of NAFTA, of course, is it, it's the only engine of economic growth for Mexico. Uh, without NAFTA, Mexico would have been in, do in the doldrums all of these 20, past 20 years. What to do with U.S. policy, uh, in terms of U.S. policy? Um, the, the more specific thing that I think that that your your efforts can 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 match the needs of Mexico, if one looks at the numbers, uh, the north of Mexico, particularly Sonora, Nuevo León, are growing at rate at the rates of 15, 16, 20 percent per year. If you look at Guerrero, Chiapas, Oaxaca, Michoacán, they are shrinking by about four or five percent per year. The differences in productivity are astounding. Part of the explanation is is insecurity, but part, but but that I think is more the problem than 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 the than the explanation. Uh, there has there has been there has not been an attempt to bring into the modern world any of those states. The, the infrastructure that has been built, and I don't mean necessarily roads. I mean because lots of them have been built. I mean basic institutional structures, uh, basic accountability. Uh, all those things don't exist, and therefore there's the, the little businesses that spring typically don't last long. So I think that thinking along the, the lines of how to create conditions for local businesses to spring and develop, uh, and bringing investors, Mexican investors, big com bigger companies into into those areas, 
could be a very interesting thing to 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 think about. Um, I, I, it's, I'm just thinking out loud, but I think that that's an interesting thing to to work on. Miguel, uh, on Andrea's question, I agree with uh, Hector and Luis. On w back in the 80s, we thought when the central power uh, decentralized, that would be great. But actually, no, it wasn't. Making strong and powerful governors has not been nice. It's the only way is having really a strong civil society to have a bottom-up process that Mexico is still not, not there yet. On the impact of NAFTA, I I don't know if you were thinking on a negative impact of NAFTA that I cannot think of, but of course on the positive side, particularly the institutions building that that has been very positive to Mexico. On what the U.S. could do to help Mexico, I when you were asking that, that reminded me about Pastor's idea on the NAFTA fund model to the European fund that helped Spain and Portugal so much, and that in the negotiations of NAFTA was not included. But that certainly would be something. On top, of course, of what has been very much talked about on arms control, that the U.S. is the provider for the organized crime arms, and also the money laundering, uh, more tightened regulation. And on your question about uh, Robert on on migrants coming to the U.S. if uh, the Mexican economy is in trouble, well, we are already we have here between the first, second, and third, and more older generations uh, around 35 million Mexicans and half a million Mexican firms, small and medium sized firms, and and that actually. It has made a market that if if the economy and the job market is not good enough in Mexico, then they can bring their relatives, mm -hmm. friends, networks over here. And if the job market gets bad here, they go back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that that is quite, I would say, flexible, and even with all the problems in the border. So how is it trending in terms of the economy in Mexico, is it going to get better or worse? In other words, are we going to see more economic uh, downturn in Mexico leading to a greater cross-border migration? I mean, that was what Despite I was... Despite of all that we have yeah. been saying, I... Are you an optimist or I a pessimist? I keep on my this? being optimist about okay. the future of Mexico. Yeah. And I also, I also wanted to um, ask the panel, I know we have just a couple of minutes left here. Uh, I like the... Uh, the three scenarios, the, the, the idea that you put forth, uh, Miguel, I mean, you, you have the optimistic, the pessimistic, and then the intermediate, which is a combination of them. And you gave 25% to the optimistic, 25% to the pessimistic, and 50% to the intermediate. And yet, as I listed, tried to list in my mind and in my notes, all of the points that were being made by the panelists, it seemed to me that the pessimistic list is far longer than the optimistic list. Uh, and that would there, therefore spill over into the intermediate list. So my, uh, uh, which would of course add greater pessimism than optimism to the intermediate list, if you follow my logic sure, here. Sure. Uh, so what I'm asking the panel uh, as kind of a summary takeaway for all of us here is whether they agree with your tripartite uh, list, the 25%, 25%, 50%, or would they give greater emphasis to the pessimistic side uh, and therefore uh, greater pessimism to the upper, to the to the possibility that Peña Nieto is going to going to going to uh, be more than a spent force, which of course was the subject of this uh, topic that we talked about this afternoon. So I'm just trying to pull things together and asking you to help a little bit more on this at the end. But thanking you for an outstanding panel. But I'd like to ask you to address that in a couple of minutes, if you could. If uh, okay. Uh, on the scenarios, the weighting of the scenarios, what I would say is that we humans react in the border of the precipice. So when mm -hmm. we see things kind of far away, we may not act strong mm -hmm. enough. 
but as it gets close, my feeling is that uh, the the political system, the PRI, the Peña Nieto uh, uh, team may simply get back to action in, in a more strengthful way. And that that's part of my optimism. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the intermediate scenario is plausible. Uh, it's bad enough, however. Uh, I don't think I don't think uh, things will necessarily get any worse. Uh, I very much think that those that wanted Peña Nieto to resign uh, have made uh, somewhat irresponsible uh, demands and expectations and. Uh, Peña Nieto has three more years, and, and he will finish. Uh, status quo is plausible. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is, uh, M Miguel just said it yet again, the problem is the political system. The problem is that center-left has disappeared in terms of uh, organized uh, party. Um, there is at the level of civil society, and, and the PAN is in, uh, in trouble. Uh, but the, for, for that intermediate scenario to become a more optimistic scenario, well, a, a, a dramatic improvement in the health of the political system would be necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and finally, uh, Luis, you have the last word. Um, I, I won't talk about the scenarios. I don't agree with the assumptions that go into, it, into them. So uh, let me just say that I think that Mexico's facing a binary kind of situation in which things can either uh, deteriorate seriously, um, maybe not very very quickly, uh, or they could change for the positive very quickly, uh, just as well. And that depends on what action and how does the president address them. Uh, he could simply uh, address some of the very specific things that, that I think are in the immediate uh, of immediate concern, and that could could bring the kind of scenario that Hector just talked about, and I think that's the more likely, um, even if delayed. Uh, the other would be for for a, a really turnabout that um, ad, that would go counter against uh, what he what he stood for, but yet could begin the, a much more serious political transformation that Mexico badly needs. Well, let me uh, at, at the now at the very last minute that we have express again my thanks uh, to the panel for this outstanding uh, set of uh, presentations, and and also to you, the audience, for. Uh, the, the wonderful questions that uh, were addressed uh, to the panel, and last but not least to Ambassador Darren Bloom for having brought us all together here for what has been a, an, an excellent uh, session. Thanks again to everybody. Thank you.